Begin a 30-day free trial at audible.com and experience our unmatched selection of audiobooks and original audio entertainment, including ad-free premium podcasts like Where Should We Begin with Esther Perel. Listen in as the foremost authority on modern love, Esther Perel, meets with real couples and their stories become your stories. Join Audible today and receive a free audiobook on us. First, I gotta ask you the TV question. Yes. You ever kick down a door? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly did. Really? Yep. You know, just because you work white collar doesn't mean you don't get to kick down doors. <laughs> Steve Garfinkel was one of the FBI agents dispatched to Bernie Madoff's offices when the world's largest Ponzi scheme went bust. I tracked down Garfinkel to help me make sense of some things that Bernie told me on the phone, things that didn't add up. It's, when I say nightmare, <clears throat> that's a nightmare. Imagine not being able to tell anybody. Bernie wanted me to believe that he carried the crushing weight of this secret alone, that he had the technology to pull this off all by himself, just Bernie and his computers. But wait. He also told me... Everybody was greedy. Everybody wanted to go on, and I just went along with it. It was a paradox. How was Bernie both the mastermind of this record fraud and also someone controlled by others? Madoff had let me inside his emotional life, made me feel sorry for him. But when it came to the mechanics of his crimes, the details, he floated above it all, refused to let me in needed to get inside the criminal enterprise to understand what had actually happened, what was actually true. That former FBI agent I found, Steve Garfinkel, was trained as a CPA, and he'd investigated other Ponzi schemes. Garfinkel spent a lot of time inside the office where Madoff's Ponzi scheme was conducted. He would take me inside and back in time, starting with the Monday morning after Madoff's arrest. What's your impression when you're walking through this year? I walked in, I was thinking, what the hell is going on here? There are a lot of people trying to get upstairs to the 17th floor, and you know they won't let them in in the, in the lobby. And they were screaming for their, their money? Yeah. We want to go up to the offices. And <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, boy, you know, some people are pissed off here. For more than a year, Garfinkel worked out of Madoff's offices meeting his employees, examining the records and physical evidence. In case you can't tell, Garfinkel loved this case. You just get a feeling that, oh, this is going to be a good one. You just know it. And it has all the elements. There's money, sex, there's crazy behavior. And that's actually what I miss most about the FBI is you get to meet interesting people and put them in jail. I don't know. One of those people was Frank DePascali, who worked for Madoff in the investment advisory department. Too bad he was a criminal, because I loved hanging out with this guy. So did Madoff. Frank DePascali started working for Madoff in 1975, one year out of high school. His childhood babysitter hooked him up with the job. Madoff liked him, but had almost fired him. Frank DePascali overslept. He was a terrible trader. But Madoff saw something in young Frank. He was smart. So Madoff kept him around for 33 years. That was really the only job he ever had. His only you know, job in an adult life. And he would rise to become Madoff's right-hand man. But after Madoff confessed, Frank DePascali made a big decision. 
He really went the path that most of the other people did not. He went from Team Madoff to Team America. And he sang like a bird, as they say. Day after day, the FBI picked Frank DePascali up in New Jersey and drove him into Manhattan for interrogation. And day after day, he was debriefed by assistant U.S. attorney Matthew Schwartz. Yeah, he always packed his lunch because uh, he, he had no money, so he couldn't, you know, we would all go out and buy a salad or something, and uh, he couldn't afford to do that. He would always bring uh, a sandwich, and uh, he always brought uh, a sleeve of Oreos. Uh, you know, I think he must have gone to Costco or something and bought them in bulk, so he would bring in a sleeve, and he would eat a few and, you know, offer them to other people. There were a few times where uh, I brought my kids in on the weekend. Um, they never met Frank DePascali, but sometimes the Oreos would be left over and they would, they would have one of what they called bad guy cookies. You guys aren't allowed to buy him lunch? Uh, I don't know if we're allowed to or not, but we didn't. I mean, you know, the, generally, he's not our friend, right? And we're not doing him favors. I told Garfinkel what Schwartz said. See, that's bullshit, because if I was there, I said, Frank, you're not eating that shit. We're going to go out and eat right. According to confidential FBI records and court documents, Frank DePascali's testimony was the key to understanding how Madoff's operation worked. So they would pick a return, and then they'd work backwards? Yeah, well, that's how a Ponzi scheme works, right? Uh, you invest $10 on January, and by June, I've got to show $15 in your account. So how do I get $10 to appreciate to $15? in the investment advisory business, used to keep boxes of old Wall Street journals, and they would take the stock tables, the stock prices that were um, published every day at the time, and they would just lay them out end to end on the floor. Picture this for a moment. So it'd be, you know, I can't imagine, 10, 20, 30 feet of newspapers side to side. And so you'd sit in a, a office chair that had wheels, a wheelchair, and you just sort of slide left and right to pick the right day with the right stock with the right price. Easy to make money in the market if you're wheeling into the past. There weren't newspapers when investigators got there. They had computers by then, and that was the next clue. It turned out that in the computers, there was a smoking gun in code. Once I got into and actually started to understand the computer programs, it was so plain to me exactly how guilty those people were. And, and Because they had to understand everything? That's my producer, Ellen Horn. Because they wrote it, and it, it was the machinery through which the entire fraud was perpetrated. It made up all the fake records. Most of it was automated. The computer guys, George Perez and Jerry O'Hara, were key to executing the fraud. You have to appreciate the computer programs. They're, first of all, they're the only two guys who are writing these programs. And they work the way that all computer programmers do. They basically sign their work. So in the actual text of the computer programs, they have notes with their names and the function of the program. So this is a random number generator for use in connection with the 2004 SEC examination of Madoff Securities. That is, I mean, oh, that's right there in the text of the program. In other words, this is the program used to dupe the SEC in its 2004 investigation. Knowledge was power in Madoff's inner circle. The computer guys knew this. Without their skills, Madoff's dream factory shuts down. They exploited that knowledge. And one day, the computer guys march into Madoff's office while Frank is there, and they say, you know, we know what you're doing, and uh, we don't want to do it anymore. And Madoff says, okay, fine. Don't, don't write those programs anymore. And then right afterwards, he turns to Deep Pascali after they've gone and said, give them whatever they want. These guys are ticking time bombs. And uh, we, we got to make sure that these guys are taken care of, that they're placated. You don't need these guys blowing up. So D. Pascali comes to them with this offer. Uh, they have a hilarious conversation where D. Pascali says, you know, whatever you want, name your raise. So according to Frank, one of the computer guys says, well, can you pay us in diamonds? You know, that, oh. that way there won't be a, a paper trail. Can you pay us in diamonds? 
diamonds. T. Pascali says at the time, like, what are you talking about? Where am I going to get a bag of diamonds? I'm not paying you in diamonds. And so the computer guys got a raise, not in diamonds, but enough to keep them quiet. Who else had rolled up their sleeves and had an inside view? So we have, for especially Annette Von Drino, Annette, that's Frank Pascali's former babysitter, the one who got him the job. Extensive personal records. And, you know, she would test out different permutations. All right, what if I do it on Tuesday? No, the return isn't good enough if I do it on Tuesday. What if I... What if I say that it was purchased on Monday instead? Oh, okay, that does it. And sometimes she'll circle it and she'll underline it. uh, She was very expressive in her writing. Annette selected a trade, then it was entered into the computer, which fabricated those fake statements, which had to be printed and mailed out. Even if you took a look at that statement that Madoff sent you, you know, it was the old-fashioned dot matrix printer where you tore off the the perforation this is like something out of uh, from 30 years ago and in fact that's because the computer system that was used to generate these statements was the AS400 system and it was an ancient computer system on the phone Madoff had boasted to me now I had the technology you know, I built artificial intelligence that gave us a good feel for the market I had pictured traders surrounded by flashing screens Trades ticking by, Bloomberg machines feeding bond prices, commodity prices, headlines flashing. That was true in the legitimate businesses, not in the one Bernie ran. Bernie was almost like a Luddite. A $65 billion fraud run with 30-year-old technology? Here's Bernie from prison in a 2012 deposition, never before heard publicly. I just, I never had an email address. I tried to stop it in the whole firm, but my traders felt they had to have instant messaging, they had to have emails because this was the way they functioned. Why was Madoff so opposed to moving into the 21st century? I have my own theory on why Madoff remained stuck in the technology dark ages. But Madoff points to something else. We had lesbians of size emails. Well, (laughs) I did not see that coming. And I'll explain what it means after the break. Saying you're hired is easy, but when it comes to finding the perfect candidate for the job, you're going to need a little help. At least I do. So I use ZipRecruiter to help me avoid crushing waves of resumes and job seekers. ZipRecruiter lets you post to over 100 job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. That means no more juggling calls to the office or emails. You can screen candidates, rate them, and hire who you need fast. ZipRecruiter also finds candidates in any city and industry nationwide. All you do is post once and watch the qualified candidates roll in. And their friendly and human support staff is ready and willing to help with any issue. Posting your job in one place isn't enough to find the quality candidates. Right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash Ponzi. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Ponzi. I just, I never had an email address. Uh, I tried to stop it in the whole firm, but my traders felt they had to have instant messaging. They had to have emails because this was the way they functioned. Why was Madoff so opposed to moving into the 21st century? He cited one reason, porn. When we monitored our trading room emails, it was a total disaster. We, we had lesbians of size emails. Uh, it was ridiculous. I mean, we had guys that were, you know, that's what they did all day long. Sure, Bernie was afraid he'd be consumed by porn also. No digital trail if there's no email. Maybe there was another reason Bernie didn't upgrade. The system worked. Maybe new technology was too much of a risk. Then what? Hire new programmers? Work on the 17th floor, that was a lifetime appointment. Right. When you, when you need people to work, you, know, you don't go to a search firm, an executive search firm. I mean, you ask, do you know somebody from the neighborhood? I mean, do you have a friend who could, you know, help out, who might, you know, want a job here? You know, 
kind of get in on this? You know, he never explicitly said, I'm sure Bernie never said, do you have somebody who could help to keep this Ponzi scheme going? No, you're not going to say that. Madoff's operation ran on more than perforated paper and old printers. It was about people, people he could trust. But how much did those trusted people know? In another deposition, this one from 2015, on the question of who knew, Bernie admits he protected his staff, including his protege, Frank DePascali. I was protecting Frank. There's no, I'll acknowledge that, all right? But that was all. Then Frank sang to the feds, and Bernie's tune changed. The only one that would know uh, would be Frank, that Frank was the only one that would know that it, the trades weren't being done. Nobody else would really uh, be sure about that. And who else on the 17th floor knew that new investor money coming in was being used to pay off redemptions? Nobody would know that except uh, Frank. They would have no real way of knowing because the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. A jury didn't agree. Five Madoff employees, including Annette and the computer guys, pled not guilty and went to trial. Their defense? Bernie, former chairman of the NASDAQ, said it was all kosher. Frank died as he was awaiting to be sentenced, but his vivid, detailed testimony helped convict the five, which pissed off Bernie. Do you believe Mr. DiPascali to be truthful? No. You do not? Okay. Well, I want to show you... I mean, not, not totally truthful, I should say. Okay. Yeah. And why do you question his veracity? Because the comments that he made are not true and are ridiculous. The operation was ridiculous. Trading back in time with a rolling chair and newspapers, demanding to be compensated in diamonds, and that hiring policy, only friends and family need apply, no experience necessary. It's a, an office sitcom, right? So sometimes it gets a little bit ridiculous, but mostly it's just people who go to work every day and write things on pieces of paper and type into a computer, and you wouldn't, unless you knew what they were writing, or unless you walk in on one of these particularly outlandish moments, it, it looked like a normal office. Imagine it, made off the sitcom. Picture the opening montage of characters Frank, chain-smoking, his former babysitter Annette, the Italian grandma who's always feeding everyone, the diamond-loving computer guys, and Bernie, lovable, old-fashioned Bernie with his catchphrase, trust me. And the sets, they all got rich, fabulously rich. De Pascali's house in New Jersey. It's just like uh, Tony, Soprano. Tony Soprano's house. Annette had a multi-million dollar beach condo. With an enormous outdoor kitchen, magnificent. If I was a Ponzi schemer, I'd be living there too. And more than $50 million in her family's very own Madoff account. The feds convinced me of this. Madoff didn't pull this off alone with only his antique computers. His office knew. But I couldn't imagine that these were the people that Madoff was talking about, pressuring him into it. They worked for him. They did his bidding. Another thing, looking from the outside, the average client probably didn't know. Oh, there were clues. Trades recorded on holidays. Trades made for prices they never hit. But you had to take out a magnifying glass, know what you were looking for and they went to an awful lot of trouble to make the statements look real. The counterfeits, trade confirmations, whatever documents might come under scrutiny, Bernie had pride in his workmanship. And there are stories of him, you know, holding up an original and holding up their fabrication to the light to make sure that every detail is just right, that, that they're using the right font, that the, you know, the asterisks, the, there's testimony about the asterisks having to look just so, and that being very hard to match because the real reports from the clearinghouse used when they were printed used a particular looking, particular style of asterisk. From that 2015 deposition. Let, let me just explain to you. Madoff bragged. I have four partners of Goldman Sachs, the two ex-chairmen of Merrill Lynch, 
were clients of mine. The chairman of Morgan Stanley was a client. These were all clients of mine. They got monthly statements, and they all were very familiar with all of these transactions. And every one of these people, all right, was very sophisticated. Not one of them ever s suspected that any of this trading was unreal or that couldn't be done. Madoff's boast, he was that good. He fooled them all. All of them? I heard about special clients. I had four prime big clients. Jeffrey Pickauer, Norman Levy, Carl Shapiro, and Stanley Chase, commonly referred to as the big four. It was very clear that those accounts in particular, Shapiro, Levy, um, Pickauer, and Chase, were handled very differently from other accounts and were handled in a way that, you know, it mattered less if there was a mistake. For these accounts, the workmanship was quite different, more demanding, less exacting. Some uh, employees were more meticulous than others, and some clients you could afford to be less meticulous with. Annette Bongiorno had been there a long time. She was employee number one in the Ponzi business. Garfinkel told me she handled the accounts of the big four. Annette's clients, the way she fagazied their uh, account statements, there were some instances when the customers got their account statements from Annette and complained that, oh, am I, you know, you promised me, uh, you know, 18% and I only got 16%. And they sent this, the statement back to Annette. So then she would do a new statement when miraculously you got the, uh, yeah, your new statement with a new higher return. Madoff himself says the accounts of the big four were fagazied. They were doing all sorts of schmadre trades. It's a Jewish term that we use where they were, you know, taking lost trades and you, the, the stuff that they did was unbelievable. And they were doing it through me. They demanded Bernie do kinkier maneuvers. Stanley Chase, for example, there was explicit testimony that he would not tolerate a single losing trade in his accounts. And he had a particular trading strategy where sometimes you could have a losing leg of a trade, but the trade as a whole was a winner because it was a three-legged trade. He wouldn't even tolerate that. For some reason, Every single trade, every single leg of every single trade had to be a winner. Well, that doesn't happen in real life, and no one can demand that of their money manager. Each of the big four paid back millions, in Pickhauer's case, billions of dollars. Every one of them claimed Madoff had duped them. They weren't prosecuted, and it's impossible for Schwartz to say for certain who knew what. What he can say is, there was activity in the accounts of the big four that... I think would raise questions in the eyes of anyone. Now, you might believe that your genius money manager can get you 700% return in a good year, but no one has the ability to rewrite history and turn stocks into bonds. And so these men, mostly older, powerful mentors to Madoff, opened for me a new door into the Madoff Ponzi operation. They gave Bernie his break, and then demanded that he provide them things he couldn't honestly achieve. Maybe Bernie Madoff was not always the puppet master. There were others who suspected Bernie was at times the puppet. David Sheehan is an expert on Madoff's operation, the expert. He is lead attorney overseeing more than a thousand lawsuits to recover money for Madoff's victims. We'll get into that later. As he looked at the patterns of deposits, withdrawals, and profits, Sheehan began to suspect that there were a handful of clients who were a bit like the computer guys. They weren't asking to be paid in diamonds, but Bernie couldn't say no to them. Mm -hmm. And basically the, the, the modus operandi there was, hey, I know what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm going to take a lot of money out. That's what they did. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I don't think people know about that, do they? No, I don't think that's widely known. <laughs> I don't think people thought of Bernie being, you know, uh, blackmailed because probably everyone thought, or at least they all maintained the posture of I didn't know anything. 
Well, also, I think certainly in the public perception, Bernie's the powerful one. He's conning people, but right. you're saying exactly the opposite. Yeah, I think he was to a certain extent a tool of these people. You know, uh, you know, he may have started out as a Ponzi, but I think they helped him perfect it. These people, the people who got the 700% returns, never a losing trade. I'd started with Madoff, the supernova whose collapse dragged $65 billion down a dark hole. But the metaphor needed refining. The center of gravity? Maybe it was just simple greed. They had a sense something was not right. Right. Okay. But they just, no one, everybody was greedy. Everybody wanted to go on, and I just went along with it. Many constellations circled that powerful force, greed. Madoff was just one star in orbit. A brightly burning star, to be sure. But there were others. After all, the rolling chairs and vintage technology didn't seem like the work of a criminal mastermind, more like Wall Street meets Rube Goldberg. So how had he gotten away with it for so long? How had the regulators and watchdogs missed the mark? How far did trust me really go? Next time on Ponzi Supernova. It's like something out of a, a movie. I mean, you, you, you really don't even think that this is possible. It wasn't just one exam. An exam in 1992, an investigation in 1992, another exam in 2004, another exam in 2005, an investigation in 2006. I figured that's it. They got me. You know, how many perfect storms can they have? Ponzi Supernova is an Audible Originals production. Hosted by Steve Fishman and produced by Ellen Horn. Our production team is Kelly Prime and Todd Whitney, with help from Jane Cohen. Colin Campbell is our editor. Our score was created by Darren Gray, Mike Cruz, and Glenn Kochi. Our audio was mixed by Mike Cruz. For more information, go to ponzisupernova.com. This is Audible.